So welcome back, everybody, after lunch for us here in the room, for everyone who is dialing in. Uh, I don't know whether you had lunch or breakfast or dinner or whatever. Um, great to have you back here. We have about what I just heard about 150 attendants here um, uh, online, but also in the room. So all together, a, a very good attendance here. And um, I'm very grateful um, that you're here today for this session. Now, the first panel that we had before the break um, focused on what the insurance sector and capital market initiatives can do to reduce the climate's insurance protection gap. And the focal of, focus of this panel is now the role um, of the public sector in bolstering resilience to extreme weather events and climate events. Now, we cannot divorce the discussion of the insurance gap from discussions of government liability since whether implicitly or explicitly, the public sector tends to hold the residual risk of extreme weather events. Without action to address the insurance gap, the public burden is likely to increase as climate change is expected to increase the number and severity of extreme weather events. In the absence of private insurance to finance the rebuild and compensate losses, governments are expected to step in. These expectations of public support can inhibit the private take-up of insurance as such, and as such is a, a, a really well-known example for moral hazard. The impact on government finances is twofold. First, there is higher expenditure on reconstruction. But second, a slower recovery from uninsured events means lower tax revenues for governments and higher spending on certain categories such as unemployment benefits. There is an impact, too, on inequality, since catastrophes tend to have greater impact on the poorest and more vulnerable in the society. The public sector is not only the holder of residual risks, but can also have an important role in facilitating private insurance markets and risk sharing. Examples given in the discussion paper include setting standards and regulations, which can encourage effective adaptation to the impact of climate change and stimulate private risk insurance. The public sector can also facilitate the developments of instruments that enable more effective risk sharing, such as public-private partnerships and catastrophe bonds. Both can help to reduce the public share of losses arising from extreme events. However, as the role of the public sector is more concretely defined, Efforts will need to be made to avoid moral hazard appearing elsewhere. More broadly, a more integrated public approach to dealing with extreme weather events will be needed. Ideally, governments should balance the costs and the risks of ex ante or ex post spending on extreme weather events in a clear and considered way. These considerations might also include identifying which risks the private sector should ensure, which risks the government will ensure, and possibly where will need to be a managed retreat. Such an integrated strategy will not only prepare the public sector itself, but can also inform private actors. The discussion paper presented today also includes the possibility of European governments helping each other in this area. While this obviously requires political will, it seems pertinent to explore potential benefits of such solutions as the consequences of climate change stretch across borders and policies. Reducing the impact of climate change might thus be considered a European or even global public good. In their paper, ECB and IOPA set out some ideas how such solidarity could be designed to be effective. In advanced economies, such as the euro area, the fiscal impacts of extreme events may have so far been modest. However, with climate change, the past is not a good predictor of the future. We thus need to, take to, to, need to think about these questions and about uh, how to put in place uh, robust frameworks before the effects of climate change become all too visible. With this, I would like to turn to the panelists that we have here. I'm very happy um, to, to welcome two, four distinguished speakers whose expertise and different perspectives will surely help us develop new insights on these questions. The first panelist is Ikuzuahi Iahen, Secretary General of the Insurance Development Forum in London. This is a public-private partnership 
led by the insurance industry and supported by the World Bank and the United Nations and other international organizations, aiming to enhance the use of insurance to build greater resilience against disasters. So welcome to this panel, Equasahei. Thank you. Then we have Olivier Mahul, Global Lead and Program Manager of the Disaster Risk Financing and Insurance Program. This program is a joint program between the World Bank and the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery and is supported by donor partners. The program provides advisory services on financial protection against the natural disasters in more than 50 countries, mainstreaming disaster risk financing and insurance within the broader disaster risk management and climate change adapt adaptation agenda in developing countries. So thank you very much, Olivier, for being with us today. Then we have Robert Muir Wood, Chief Research Officer of Moody's Risk Management Solutions. In this function, he works to enhance approaches to natural catastrophe modeling, identify models for new areas of risk, and explore expanded explications for catastrophe <laughs> modeling. He's also the Vice Chair of the OECD high-level advisory board of the International Network on the Financial Management of Catastrophic Risks. So, Robert, welcome um, for being here. Um, great to have you on the panel. Don't see him yet, but maybe um, he can put on his camera then later. And finally, um, we have here in the room Deborah Revoltelta, who is the chief economist and director of the economics department in the European Investment Bank. In is, it is in her department that uh, the EIB Investment Report, which is the flagship product publication on investment in Europe, is produced. And this uh, is also running the EIB Investment Survey, targeting on an annual basis more than 12,000 European firms. So in that sense, um, she's at the heart of investment in Europe, and I'm very grateful that she is here today. So these were our four panelists. And um, after these opening remarks, um, I would like to invite now all of the panelists to give a short introduction into the topic. Um, and uh, Deborah, the floor is yours now. Thank, thank you very yes. much. Um, Deborah it, brought some slides. So, yes. uh, we can share them now. Thank you very much. And it's uh, really a pleasure uh, to, to be here uh, today and to also be physically here uh, at the ECB. And uh, it was uh, really a pleasure also to read uh, the report, uh, which I found uh, very interesting and uh, bringing a, a very interesting uh, point uh, for, uh, for reflection on uh, what to do next and what should be the, the rule of the public sector and how to, um, and how to develop uh, uh, this uh, further uh, this, uh, this rule. In what uh, I am presenting, I prepared a few slides, and actually uh, there are two main areas that I would like like to touch. The first one uh, is uh, I would like to bring uh, some additional evidence on uh, the challenge in terms of uh, uh, exposure to physical risk using uh, what we have at the EIB. We build a climate physical risk indicator for 180 countries around the world. And then uh, some more evidence on uh, what is uh, the, the physical risk exposure for uh, European firms uh, and municipalities and the effect of access to finance based uh, actually on uh, surveys uh, that we run on an annual basis at the EAB. And then uh, saying that, I would uh, uh, then uh, speak a little bit uh, more about uh, what uh, I think is uh, the rule for public sector and uh, particularly the EAB experience. Uh, on the uh, first evidence, so the first point, and very much corroborate what it was uh, already presented uh, in, uh, in the paper, and I guess already discussed uh, this morning, if uh, we built at the EIB a, a model to assess the exposure to physical uh, um, climate risk for 180 countries uh, is a comprehensive toolkit that uh, we developed in house because we wanted to be sure uh, of uh, how the what is uh, used to assess the exposure to risk and also how the data are uh, accounted for and aggregated. We were looking at the models uh, available in the market and we were unsatisfied of uh, 
the black box nature of uh, many of uh, these uh, toolkit. So we actually worked uh, trying to get all the information uh, that we could and then uh, re-aggregate. When doing so, we looked at uh, uh, the effect of uh, damage due, due to uh, extreme weather, agricultural losses uh, due to distress, the cost of uh, protecting for, for sea level rise, the cost of upgrading infrastructure, productivity loss uh, due to heat, uh, economic loss uh, due to weather scarcity. We re-aggregate all of this and we have a measure at the country level of uh, the exposure to this risk. And then on the other side, we always said so that it's important also to have a measure of the adaptation capacity of countries. And there very much the fiscal situation of the countries come in, so the economic ability to respond and the institutional capacity come in. What the message that I want to give, and it's basically the result that you see from this model is what you see in, uh, in the map. And darker color are countries where the physical climate risk indicator is very, very strong. And it's because the darker, the, 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 the most important exposure to risk. Basically, that uh, there is uh, many of the emerging market and low-income countries uh, that are also those that have less capacity to respond and to adapt are those most at risk. So globally, we have an issue. And here uh, you can see the different elements. On the left side is uh, where damage costs are actually recorded and happened and the effect of the exposure to losses. And on the right side, the relationship between the exposure to the risk and the adaptation capacity. And again, what you see is that actually a lot of the countries that are more exposed to the risk have a very little adaptation capacity. So in reality, you enter into this problem globally of a mismatch between the exposure to the risk and the capacity to react to the risk which is a confirmation of the importance uh, of uh, all of what was uh, discussed uh, in the paper as well. If uh, we look at uh, the European case uh, instead, and that's uh, additional evidence that come out from our work, the first graph comes from uh, our survey of European firms. We interview every year 12,500 firms in Europe, and since a few years, uh, we added a few questions on uh, the exposure of firms to physical risk, and then what is the firm doing in terms of reacting to this risk? And we ask whether the firm is having a strategy, is, um, is uh, uh, implementing a specific measure, but we also ask whether the firm is insuring. And what we find out at the firm level is that 60% or so of firms in Europe have experienced physical risk and have experienced losses related to physical risk, but more or less 10% of firms are insured. And I find it interesting because it's very much the same in a different model with a different data. In the paper, you come to very similar number. What we can do is also having granular information at the firm level. We can understand which are the firms that are more likely to invest, to, to insure, so to cover the risk. And their size definitely have, have an effect. Also, be, having already experienced losses due to physical risk is a strong motivator for for firm to insure, but there is also a very strong geographical variety. So there are some countries in which firms tend to insure and other countries in which they would never insure. So you have a lot of firm level differentiation also in terms of the, what the firm are doing. We have a similar study done on municipality. There, every two years, we interview 800 municipalities. We come out that um, more or less 90% of municipalities in Europe tell us that they experience losses due, due to physical risk. When you ask if they are doing something out of it, mostly since that they are starting to look into adaptation when they develop a new infrastructure, uh, but they are not super active in terms of adaptation as well. 
and in term on insurance is at the municipality level remains very small as well, which also decides a strong driver of adaptation of insurance, sorry, at the municipality level. So what you see both for firms and municipalities, a lot of maybe physical risk start to be experienced but uh, there is a very, very low take up uh, of insurance product, uh, both uh, for firms and uh, for municipality at the European level. We were also looking at banks. Actually, we have a study that looks at what are banks doing uh, in terms of uh, um, reconstruction support. And what we see there, we have, we mix the survey data on firms with the behavior of the banks. What you see is that actually firms, um, basically, after an event, they try to get a credit, but they are likely to be, they are less discouraged in asking for credit, but they are much more likely their credit application to be rejected, most probably because of post-event, they may have a lower collateral. So the banking sector may not be the best uh, allies for the reconstruction. And in fact, part of the story is that at least at the European level, there is a lot of pushback to the government, to the state, to be the lender of last resort, if you want, for the reconstruction side. But it brings also to the adaptation part, that a lot of the burden is moved to the public sector on the adaptation side. Saying that, uh, I come uh, to the point of uh, what can the public sector do, and uh, mostly I would like to say something on the EAB experience. The EAB is a, is a public uh, institution, it's uh, owned by the European member states, is uh, an institution that is actually uh, lending uh, lately we just uh, turned to be the climate bank, so very much with a strong green agenda both in terms of our lending for mitigation of adaptation and overall commitment. I don't enter into all the details of what we are doing. Just want to say that we started rising our ambition on adaptation, where in Europe, actually, investment in adaptation is extremely low. And also on our side, it's 5% of our climate action lending with an ambition to go to 15%. But in reality, there is a very little going on in terms of adaptation at the European level in terms of investment. We think there is a strong rationale to intervene because the market failures related to adaptation are quite important. Normally, it's perceived as being a public good, so need for public intervention. And it's very rare that the pub private sector would look into uh, the adaptation, if not, to t if not in some cases, so new, new construction to make more resilient. But the bigger part of the adaptation effort is considered to be still a public good to be produced by the public sector. There are a lot of externalities that are not internalized in the moment in which you act at the private level. There are some interesting examples. If you think that if you pave your, uh, if you have an house, uh, an house and uh, you pay the place where uh, pay the place where you pay, um, park your car, you have a negative externalities in the sense that uh, there is no more drainage of uh, water. So you create a, a negative externality that is not priced in in the moment in which you do that. So you have uh, you have actually again a, a, a motivation for considering it. Uh, as a market failure or a need to have the public sector producing. Um, lack of information and asymmetric information, there is not always a binding regulation. And on the public sector side, it's often easy to, um, those are investment for adaptation that are always often easy to be deprioritized in the moment in which a lot of pressing investment comes in. It's not the right thing to do, we know, but if the pressure, if you think of the, the short frame of the electoral campaigns and the electoral period, 
something that has a risk every 20, every 30, every 14 years is something that you may deprioritize in your uh, um, investment plan. So there is a strong rationale for a public sector rule. At the EIB, we see our rule mostly on the adaptation side, rising awareness, trying to have a, we have a new policy for a smarter and faster adaptation to try to have adaptation in every project that we finance. We have it in the technical assistance of our own project. We always look at it. And we have also um, what we call emergency financing. Actually, is a, is a, a normal line of business that we would do after emergency. We would finance the reconstruction very much with the private and public sector financing a reconstruction. That means that uh, uh, we charge our funding cost, AAA funding cost, in favor of reconstruction through it uh, with uh, very long maturity and support. So at the European level, uh, there is uh, some way of emergency financing uh, through lending activities uh, coming, uh, coming uh, uh, from our side. I think uh, for now I would stop. Uh, the, if I have to summarize uh, all what I was saying, very much share the focus on the risk and the fact that um, there is a very little going on in terms of insurance. If I have to think at the rule of the public sector, there is a strong rule of the public sector. I see very much also in terms of institutional involvement, a lot of a very strong rule for more action in adaptation with the public sector intervening. And uh, that's partly what we are doing. I think uh, the discussion on the insurance is very interesting, but uh, I think uh, the point is to understand uh, where is the balance uh, between uh, what the insurance sector should be, what is uh, the residual rule of the public sector, and uh, the moral hazard between the two is uh, very important to address. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Deborah. I mean, that was very, very insightful. And I think we, we will come back to, to exactly this question yeah. of the moral hazard and what should the, actually the public sector do? What should the private sector do? And how we can make sure that these trade-offs that are there, um, that they are at least, you know, that we think about them and, and try to address them. Now, um, my next speaker um, is Ekko Zaidi. Um, um, I'll give you the floor now for your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank, you very, thank you very much, Christian, and uh, also Deborah for such a comprehensive, I think, context setting for, for the discussion. I, I think the role of insurance in supporting economic growth has received increasing attention over the past few years, as, as Deborah had mentioned. Um, its value in terms of disaster risk uh, financing um, and disaster risk mitigation services has really come to the fore when we think about climate change and some of the conversations that are happening there as relates to uh, adaptation, as was said earlier. Uh, but even beyond climate risk, as we all know, uh, the insurance plays a critical role in terms of addressing life health risks <coughs> and also in supporting humanitarian uh, response aid, etc. And there's increasingly a nexus in terms of the concerns that we are seeing in terms of uh, climate risks um, and that function that the insurance industry also plays. Um, naturally, I don't think I, I need to state this, but as a cornerstone of um, the economy, uh, it provides critical social safety nets, uh, and particularly for vulnerable populations. Um, but the reality, again, as Deborah had referenced, is that there are significant risk exposures and losses that are occurring and we expect to increase that are not covered by insurance, but could potentially be. Uh, and this takes us to the whole question around the protection gap. Uh, the reality also is that the protection gap exists in every country, developing, emerging, developed. Uh, but the reality is that they are greater in emerging and developing countries where the consequences um, of uninsured risks can be even more severe and long lasting because of a lack of personal or state resources to meet these losses. So the same principle obviously applies in developed economies where you have so huge swaths of vulnerable population uh, who also don't have the depth in terms of uh, financial protection that are needed when we think about climate uh, change and the risks that we see on, on the horizon even today. Uh, sadly, the consequence of this is that 
uh, we have limited uh, resilience across the board, uh, but we are also seeing these disasters increasingly play out every day. From the experience in Italy, uh, a few months ago, we saw the experience in Malawi, in Mozambique, and almost a sort of numbness that has crept into the system in terms of how these disasters are evolving and how and urgency around responding uh, to them. Um, so from our perspective, there is a significant amount of work that we believe that the insurance industry can obviously do in terms of helping to address this issue. Yes, it, it's um, in terms of investing in more innovative, being a bit more creative in terms of the risk financing, uh, risk mitigation products that are on offer. Uh, perhaps some of the products that are offered to corporate clients, we can increasingly expand and make that available more to uh, our public sector counterparts. Uh, but this also points to the important point that was uh, mentioned earlier, which is the power of governments is also important when we think about closing the protection gap. And public-private partnerships are especially critical here. Again, reflecting on COVID-19, climate change, what we've seen, I think, in the population, if we listen and are, are, are listening to people, is a surge in terms of an increase in risk awareness. And with this, I think, is coming a corresponding need for an appreciation um, and demand from the public in terms of better financial protection and risk sharing systems. Um, I believe that insurance has an important uh, role to play here. And so from the perspective of the Insurance Development Forum, which, as you mentioned, Christian, earlier, is an initiative that is led by the insurance industry, co-chaired with the United Nations as well as World Bank Group. So ple I'm pleased to see Olivia here. Uh, we have as our mandate the objective uh, to expand and optimize the use of insurance to help drive resilience. If it's at the individual business level, precisely for what was mentioned earlier, the fact that we are talking about in developing countries, three to 5% insurance penetration rates. So its function as a shock absorber is quite limited. Uh, and so for us, we believe that this is why we must engage and we have been increasingly doing so uh, with the broader policy discussions that are taking place around climate resilience and adaptation and really trying to push the boundaries in terms of the role that insurance can play in terms of financial protection, um, given what we are seeing in terms of, of the impacts of climate change. We've engaged heavily with the G7 and we've seen it emerge in some of the communique around the importance of, uh, of risk transfer and financial protection. We've engaged with the V20 countries, with the G20, and we see um, a rise of this topic on, on the agenda politically. But for us, it's also important that we move beyond just discussion and recognizing this as, an, as a problem to actually investing in the solutions, right? Actually getting to implementation, being innovative, experimenting, exploring what these solutions could potentially be. And for us, that means exploring again, how do we deepen understanding around these risks and deepen national capabilities to manage and understand these risks? How do we develop uh, or engage with regulators around the development of insurance markets that could play a much more um, robust role within these markets? How do we again invest in the development of these solutions? If it is in inclusive insurance, working directly with governments on their risk financing strategies, but also thinking of insurers as institutional investors and what are the opportunities to invest more in infrastructure in emerging markets. So for us, this is an important and critical um, agenda. And so we are pleased to obviously be part of this conversation here today uh, because we believe that the consequences are profound if we do not tackle it. So really thank you, uh, Christian and, and the team for the invitation to be part of this discussion. Great, thank, thank you very much. Um... Actually, our next speaker would have been Robert, but I think he has problems connecting. So I would give the floor now first to Olivier. Um, and uh, the floor is yours for your introductory remarks. Thank you, Christian and colleagues. I hope you can uh, hear me well. Yes. Perfect. Great. So first of all, thanks a lot for the invite. It's, of course, a very hot topic, uh, even in the context of the World Bank. And I'm going to take the perspective of, uh, of uh, emerging developing economies to, to some extent to balance what uh, what Deborah was was talking about for more advanced economies. But as Equisway mentioned, the, the, project, the projection gap is there. The question, of course, is how you can fill it in. So from, from the bank perspective, of course, this topic of disasters and climate risks um, are quite important because it does impact development. It does impact poverty reduction. 
Uh, just a few numbers to keep in mind. The average uh, annual losses uh, related to disaster are estimated about $300 billion. If you take into account the indirect impact, including consumption losses, it's, uh, it's, uh, it goes to um, up to $520 billion a year. And following COVID uh, and the last three years, the number of uh, people falling into extreme poverty raised by about 70 million. So this is definitely something that we need to tackle. And of course, the recent earthquake in Syria and Turkey with more than $30 billion of losses is also a good example that you, we need to do something where I think in that context, more than $5 billion of losses were insured. So it gives you a sense in that context of a large prostitution gap. So from the bank perspective, examples of this kind of public-private partnership, and this is something we've been doing for a long time. Uh, um, one, because um, uh, countries do have severe budget constraints, so they need to be very careful on how they, they use their public funding, but also the World Bank itself, as many other development agencies, do have limited balance sheets. So we need to mobilize, we need to leverage private capital. Uh, and as Ekosu mentioned, the question is not whether we should do it, it's how we should do it. So in the context of the bank, we've been doing that in, I would say, in three key points. One is to, as I said, leverage our public funding. For example, over the last 15 years, we have developed a contingent line of credit to be disbursed in case of disaster. Uh, this is public funding, but this is very much important not only to provide emergency liquidity right after disaster for emergency response, but also because it allows us to engage before the disaster with countries on disaster risk reduction and disaster risk management. So it's a good financial incentive for countries, and particularly Minister of Finance, to engage on disaster risk management before disaster occur. And now, as I said, um, this is clearly not enough. Uh, uh, and just to give you a sense, um, the, the total envelope that we have uh, allocated to this, uh, what we call CADIDIO, this line of credit, is about four, four to five billion dollars. So it's a, it's a small amount compared to the needs. Uh, what we've done in parallel is also try to leverage private capital. One in helping countries to work together, and we've helped develop some risk pools, uh, uh, whether it's in the Caribbean, in the Pacific, or now it's in Southeast Asia. So it's also a way to, for countries to access uh, uh, capital markets in good, in, on good terms. And uh, the World Bank has also developed its own CAD bond platform, where again, we've been helping countries, mainly middle-income countries, to access uh, private capital and to use sophisticated products like CAD bonds uh, to, uh, to increase their uh, uh, emergency liquidity after disaster. And of course, the question is, um, is not only to use those tools, but also to be able to combine those products, those instruments, to make them as efficient as possible. And I think the key point we need to discuss is clearly to go beyond products and to think of strategies. What are the opt optimal strategies countries should put in place to protect their own budget, but also to protect households, to protect businesses, and to protect uh, farmers. Um, three key messages I'd like to highlight, if you allow me, in a few, uh, in a few, in a few minutes. Uh, and those messages come from a, a technical contribute, contribution we just uh, produced uh, on behalf, I mean, for the, uh, the, the Japan as chair of the uh, G7, uh, um, uh, um, G7 process. The first one is that we, ha we have to be optimistic, and I think Ecosway, uh, um, I would say, shared their um, our, our views on that one, because the topic of climate and disaster risk finance is playing an increasing role in climate change and adaptation. And if you look backward, like even five years ago, the topic was clearly not uh, uh, as important as it is today. So this is the good news. The second good news is that uh, I think collectively, uh, together with the private sector, we have made significant progress on climate and disaster risk finance, whether it's on the policy side, on the technical side, and on the operational side, including some pilots or even scaling up some, some programs, and I can give you a few examples. And the third message i like to convey is that when we look forward in terms of the priorities, at least from our perspective of the World Bank, this is very much on, one, setting up the, the right institutional setup, because if you want something to be sustainable and effective and impactful, it has to be institutionalized, if I may say in the uh, in in the uh, in in the, in the broader context two is to facilitate access to private capital and there are many ways to do it including through private public private partnerships last but not least uh, and particularly in in developing economies this is very much around shock, developing shock responsive systems on top on top of financial um, uh, i would say financial preparedness and insurance is one of the instruments 
around financial preparedness. It's very important to help countries be prepared on the operational side, practically to make sure that the funding doesn't get stuck somewhere, uh, let's say, in Treasury, or, uh, you know, and then not being fully, I would say, disbursed to the uh, ultimate beneficiaries. And from the bank side, we've seen challenges not only in the financial preparedness, as I just mentioned, but also in the operational preparedness, because SIMSENS are not in place. Uh, in developed economies, you can count on the private sector sometimes to pass the money uh, from, you know, uh, ultimately from financial markets to the ultimate beneficiary through insurance policies. In developing economies where the insurance, domestic insurance market is clearly underdeveloped, you don't have these kind of channels in place. So you need to combine that with some public channels like social safety nets or any other means uh, that will also you know, help uh, the ultimate beneficiaries to access this funding. Um, last but not least, and I'll, I'll finish on that point if you allow me, um, one of the big distinctions I would make when, it, when we talk about insurance in developed versus emerging and developing economies um, is about the development of the domestic insurance markets. Uh, which is clearly underdeveloped in those uh, developing economies and which, again, creates significant challenges uh, to protect the ultimate beneficiaries. So one of the key um, challenges we're facing is, again, not only to access capital and international capital, but to make sure that we can also develop domestic capital, domestic financial markets, domestic insurance markets that ultimately uh, will provide the, uh, the, 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 the solutions, at least part of the solutions, to the uh, to to, uh, to to the reduction of the uh, of the protection gap, so let me let me stop here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Olivier. Now I see that Robert, uh, you you managed to log in. Um, the floor is yours for your opening remarks. Okay, thank you. I wanted to give a little bit of history to to this subject. So, um, in in the USA through the 1960s. After big uninsured flood damages from Hurricane Betsy and Camille, the federal government tried to get the private insurance sector to cover the risk. But insurers did not know how to price flood risk or anything about tail losses, so private insurers declined. By the late 1960s, the government had, had, to, come up, had to come up with their own scheme, the National Flood Insurance Program, the NFIP. The, the FEMA agency, Federal Emergency Management Agency, spent hundreds of millions of dollars on mapping the estimated historical one in 100 year, 1% 1 annual probability flood zone, including working with local communities to accept the map. Today, wealthy homeowners hire flood engineers to contest the map because falling into the flood zone devalues your property. Initially, few homeowners bought flood insurance, so in the 1970s, the government made it a requirement that anyone taking out a government-backed mortgage or home loan whose property was inside FEMA's 1% flood zone had to buy NFIP flood insurance. However, the banks only check for insurance in the first year, so that the proportion with flood insurance lapses at around 25% each year. In the UK from the 1960s, comprehensive flood cover was added to fire insurance. Even after big flood losses, as in 2007, insurers committed to a few more years of flood coverage within fire insurance, as long as the government committed to spending even more on flood defenses. By 2010, what undid both the US and UK schemes was high resolution probabilistic flood risk modeling. This opened Pandora's box of flood risk quantification that could never be closed again. It made possible cat bonds for flood, I worked on the first one for European flood risks. It made possible building specific flood risk underwriting. Insurers could cherry pick the risks. In the US, the NFIP had to run to the federal government to get bailed out because they weren't collecting enough premium, in particular in 2005 Katrina and 2016 Harvey. In private insurers in the UK, it was now possible to price the flood risks specific to that property. Those at highest risk might be charged more than 1% of their property value for annual flood insurance. Meanwhile, the owner would write a scathing letter to their member of parliament and to the press complaining how unfair this was to the point that the government was forced to take action and come up with the flood re-concept, which involved identifying those at highest risk above some model threshold. Flood re reinsures this pool while all those at lower flood risk pay a small levy to reduce the premium cost of those at high risk to a tolerable maximum. Buildings constructed after 2009 cannot be in the subsidized pool. 
while the whole scheme is intended to taper away by 2039, by when high flood risk to domestic property is meant to have been adapted away, but we shall see. For now it seems to be working quite well, but we have not seen a significant flood catastrophe since it was launched, but, but, but it is not linked with adaptation, which is a topic I think we'll come to later in this discussion. I read the, the EIOPA, the OPA report with interest, concerned with the protection gap, but mostly focused on new opportunities for creating multi-country risk pools or designing innovative cap bonds. However, there seems to be little in the report on what is the most central to the protection gap, the need to get more people buying insurance. If the take-up rate is currently 25% of the risk, how do we get it to 90%? There is reinsurance capacity for European risk already. So it is not a consequence of further pools or cap bonds, although they could both be useful in reducing the costs. We know what it takes to increase protection to 80 or 90% of the risk. It is not as simple as making fairly costed flood insurance available for all properties as the US experience shows. Either you make the coverage mandatory for everyone taking out a home loan, or you add the coverage to every standard fire policy or you do both. These are the only ways. I would like to, like to see more on these specific policy instruments could be applied around Europe. They already exist in France and Spain with government intervention, but without enough linkage to risk reduction and adaptation. Which of these two instruments are different European countries willing to adopt? Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert, for these also historical uh, uh, insights uh, into how, how insurance has developed. I mean, we are now ready basically to open up uh, for, for more questions. Um, and I would suggest that given uh, in the interest of times, I, I, I will sort of ask all of you one, one particular question and then we open up the floor to the audience um, if they have further questions so that we make it more um, interactive. Now, I would like to address my first question actually to you, Deborah. Um, where do you actually see the role of the public sector and public banks in supporting adaptation? Um, and, and how do you see the role on, on developing the cat bond market in the EU? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. And I think uh, on adaptation, I think I, I, I see a very strong role on the public sector. I think what I was mentioning before, I think we are talking about a public good with the public sector intervention, particularly on the uh, ex-ante part, so on adaptation side. But at the end, there is a, a lot of uh, residual rule uh, on, the, on the public sector in terms of intervention for the uninsured component. Then uh, uh, I very much agree on the point that uh, if we want to expand uh, the insurance, uh, probably the, the, the way is uh, to go to, toward uh, some uh, way of uh, mandatory insurance. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I don't know how it could be done, and I, I suspect uh, at the European level uh, that it would be complex in terms of finding uh, something uh, that is valid in all member states in terms of uh, making uh, this uh, these insurance, uh, um, in, uh, these insurance uh, mandatory. But uh, I, I think at the end, uh, the important part is uh, to make sure uh, that uh, the public sector, uh, that uh, if you want, as a responsibility ex ante on uh, the adaptation side, uh, not only, I think, uh, on the adaptation side uh, should be private and public sector, but uh, the public sector remains uh, with some responsibility as uh, providing public good. The public sector also has a responsibility at the end of the process for the uninsured part. What mm -hmm. you have to make sure is that the, the, the public sector is not also backing in the way in between the private mm -hmm. sector and at the end accumulating too much responsibility. But actually, that the intervention on the insurance part really takes out the burden on the public sector exposed. So that's on the one side. On uh, cut bonds, uh, I was uh, trying to look into uh, what uh, what uh, we are looking at at the European Investment Bank. Actually, on cut bonds, uh, we were not looking at uh, uh, cut bonds for our traditional, for our sorry, um, yeah, uh, European business, but most for uh, our business out of Europe. We are not 
yet there in terms of uh, uh, entering in the cut bond market uh, in the part uh, where we are uh, uh, looking at, and I was talking uh, to my colleague uh, more uh, directly involved, uh, they have uh, still, uh, there is uh, still a lot uh, to do with uh, data and modeling, uh, particularly because uh, most of the risks uh, that are being uh, currently covered and addressed are mostly US based risk and US based models. Mm. There is uh, less on the, on uh, other areas in which uh, we would uh, enter in the market, and uh, we don't feel uh, that we have uh, the expertise in ours and even and funding the expertise in the market would be difficult. The mm. legal structuring is still extremely heavy. So also on the um, operational side, uh, my colleagues were addressing the fact that uh, some kind of standardization and simplification in the legal structuring would be uh, important. And then uh, the point uh, that is also made in the paper, actually, of uh, the... Um, the value of diversification of uh, these investments where, uh, 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 sorry, of the portfolio, where uh, in reality the uh, pool of uh, potential investors is extremely limited. Mm. And, uh, and then uh, at the end, uh, yes, maybe they diversify on the risk, but then uh, you end up with uh, the risk concentrated with uh, uh, a very limited uh, pool of investors uh, that may have uh, enter into phases of investor mm -hmm. investment appetite. So you may have a market uh, that uh, dries up uh, very, quite uh, easily and uh, quite uh, fast uh, in, at the changing market condition. So that's uh, where we are, uh, where uh, the cut bond market uh, really seems to be very early in the development. Uh, we are looking into it, uh, but uh, not yet uh, acting. Yeah. Thank you. I think with your answer, it, it kind of gives a nice transition to a question that I had actually for Olivier. I mean, what can the public sector do in order to facilitate the inflow of alternative capital for underwriting catastrophe risk to increase risk sharing between the public and the private sector? No, no thanks for this, uh, this question. Um, as I said in my comments, from the bank perspective, it's very much around uh, private capital enabling and private capital mobilization. Uh, and car bonds are one of the many examples we need to explore further to uh, to deal with this kind of protection gap, particularly in countries developing and, uh, and uh, um, emerging economies that are clearly uh, financially constrained. So, um, again, in that context, I will make a difference between uh, um, mobilizing, I would say, domestic capital versus mobilizing international capital. And there are two different, uh, two different stories. On the, on the, on, on the, um, on the latter, uh, and again, the CAD one is a good example, I would definitely agree with Deborah that those tools tend to be quite sophisticated. They do require some significant upfront investments. And from the bank perspective, although we've been promoting that to some extent, it does respond to very specific needs, usually middle-income countries, very specific risks like earthquakes, you know, hitting a capital city, uh, uh, very, I would say, high return periods. Uh, so this is very much for us a type of instrument to cover your excess risk, your top risk, if you wish. Now, below that, there is still a lot of work to be done to make sure that even if you don't face the kind of 200-year earthquake event in your country, you can deal with a five-year flood event. And sometimes this is where we do see some, uh, some, some challenges in some of the countries that are not fully prepared, in fact, to deal with this kind of, uh, this kind of events. And usually those kind of recurrent events uh, which are not as well defined as earthquakes are not so attractive for, for the private sector. One, because the understanding of risk is much lower, and mm -hmm. two, because the, the costs of those, of those instruments, because of the low return period, will be pretty high. So this is where you need to think in terms of risk-layered approach, thinking of being able to retain as much as possible uh, when it makes sense, uh, uh, and then transfer only the excess risk, and then you can then tap into uh, 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 I would say traditional insurance market or uh, or uh, alternative uh, alternative capital like cat bonds or like cat swaps, which again, uh, from our perspective, do remain more kind of exception than the rule because of the constraints as just described. So, key market inefficiencies I would say one is, and I think Ekosui mentioned that already, data and analytics. Uh, do we have the right data? Not only in terms of the hazard, but also in terms of the exposure. 
when we engage a dialogue with a client, with a country, uh, the question is, what do you want to protect? Uh, and of course, you cannot afford protecting everything. So you need to prioritize. Do you have a good sense of your exposure? Uh, I would say implicit and exp explicit, I would say, contingency related to disasters. So what is your priority? Is it better for you? Or do you want first to protect your key public assets? Or do you want to protect your infrastructure? Or do you want to protect your, uh, uh, your low income and vulnerable people? Some decisions will have to be made because, again, funding is, is limited. And a proper, I would say, risk assessment and that analytics can be quite important. And I'm sure that you also you will, uh, will elaborate on the Global Risk Modeling Alliance, one of the examples where the private sector and the public sector are trying to work together to provide this kind of uh, uh, sophisticated uh, uh, solutions. The, the second one I would say is, again, in order to tap into alternative capital is to try to act as a risk aggregator. It may not make sense for a small island in the Pacific or in the Caribbean to access the market on its own. It does make sense for them to access as a group uh, because, first of all, you can create some economies of scale and also because you create a critical mass to be more, I would say, uh, 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 better equipped to discuss with, uh, with investors because, of course, you bring a larger amount to be, to be reinsured and then a larger business opportunity. So playing with this kind of risk aggregator rules, risk pools or platforms that some uh, development banks like the World Bank have developed does also facilitate access to market and also does also allow to standardize as much as possible uh, uh, some of those products as, uh, as Deborah mentioned. And last but not least, on the legal and regulatory framework, this is quite important, going back to the kind of, you know, uh, the, the basic policy, policy agenda, where again, in some of those countries, uh, uh, cat insurance is clearly not properly, I would say, regulated uh, in terms of capital adequacy, for example. And you don't want to end up in a situation where you, you would promote, uh, uh, I would say, uh, catastrophic risk insurance, or may some, in some cases make it mandatory when you know that the domestic insurance market is not properly equipped to pay the claims on time in full. So again, it has to be very carefully managed, again, to make sure that you don't end up in a situation where, in fact, payments will not be made, insurance claims will not be paid in full, and we've got many examples where it has happened. So again, this kind of proper legal and regular framework is also quite important also when you think of bringing more capital, including uh, alternative capital solutions. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier. Um, I would like to address the next question actually to Echo Zai, because I think you mentioned something that I think you have also some experience with, namely this question of this uh, how, how multinational risk sharing could actually work. Um, and, and this is a question that I would like to address to you. Are there any relevant examples of multinational risk sharing mechanisms in developing countries that helped build up resilience against catas catastrophe risk? And what are the main challenges related to that? I mean, you see in our paper, there's one part of it, it was exactly this kind of EU solidarity. And maybe you could say something on how this has actually worked internationally. Um, you, you are still uh, muted. Okay, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much for that question. Yes, there are a number of examples, I think, uh, that we are seeing emerging of uh, multiple countries uh, pulling risk into uh, single portfolios to try to access um, uh, capital, essentially, to help them deal with the impacts of these disasters. Uh, we have the Southeast uh, Asia Pacific Risk Pool. We have the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance uh, Facility, which the World Bank was involved in establishing. There's also the African uh, Risk Capacity. Uh, which is basically an insurance fund for, for the African continent. And maybe I will just uh, focus on that particular one because I think it's quite interesting. Um, and it is a situation where there was a very clearly defined objective for this mechanism, which is um, a, a, a risk pool that would help the governments finance response to disasters after, in, with a specific focus initially on drought risk and tropical cyclones. Uh, and through that mechanism, the countries on the African continent pool their risk into a single uh, portfolio. I think there are about 35 or so countries who are members of the ARC. Uh, and out of that, there are a number of countries that pay a premium. In addition to that, beyond the multi-country nature of it, it's also backed by parametric insurance instruments. Uh, the reason being that for many of these governments, there is a premium placed in terms of financing becoming available as quickly as possible once the event occurs. Um, and so again, this is, I think, quite important when we think about these mechanisms, uh, really trying to respond to the needs of the countries and the communities on the ground. 
Another, I think, critical dimension of the pool that could be instructive was that it was not just simply uh, the development of an insurance solution. Uh, there is a critical component that involves uh, working with the governments to address and build greater transparency around what drought risk means for these countries in terms of impact on the governments, but also impact on individuals, and particularly communities that are dependent on agriculture as a source of livelihood. And that's a significant population uh, on the African continent. So there's a risk analytics dimension, risk modeling investment, capability development that is involved in the establishment or in the operationalization of this mechanism. The second part of it that I think is quite important is that, uh, and it's something that Olivia referenced, is if we are concerned with meeting the needs of vulnerable communities, there is an opportunity to use these instruments to proactively link finance with targeted response that gets to people when they need it. So part of the work of that institution is actually working with the governments to actually try to understand if your policy was triggered, how would that money actually flow from the insurance company through government systems out into response mechanisms directly to individuals? And this can be a complex process to map, but it's essential for efficiency purpose. It's also essential when we think about risk reduction and reducing the longer term, deeper impact um, that these disasters can have when they, they unfold. So I think that represents, I think, quite an interesting model, but each risk pool has its own specific characteristic that responds to the particular region, the particular governments that are part of it. And this is part of, I think, the, the thinking that we need to adopt uh, as more governments think about these sorts of uh, collaborative efforts. In terms of the challenges associated with structuring these instruments, I like to think of it in maybe three buckets. Um, maybe the first is the governance and the institutional element, establishing um, these institutions. I think that uh, part of the challenge is ensuring ownership, right? Because this is a solidarity mechanism, right? Um, and you had mentioned earlier, over years, you might have a situation where there might be political change within a government and there might be a waning of interest in terms of understanding the importance of this mechanism. Or you might have countries that are not necessarily as affected by say drought risk compared to others and they might question their involvement. So that's a technical, but also a political a question that you really have to sort of grapple with in terms of governance. Um, but governance, I think one of the important lessons or challenges that one could potentially incur is paying attention to um, the rules of the game, if one could put it that way. And that's tied to how do we treat to the uh, transparency around consolidating perspective on what this instrument is about, what is this focus, how do we understand as a collective how to model that risk, how do we understand as a collective what this instrument is and what is its purpose? How do we understand as a collective how it is supposed to function? And so there are lots of lessons that I think that one could unpack in terms of institutionalizing these types of mechanisms. The second component where I think there are lots of uh, opportunities for lessons learned, not only challenges, is on the operationalization. So again, a lot of these instruments require multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary expertise. It's not just simply a question for the Ministry of Finance. It's a question for the Ministry of Environment, a question for housing, a question for education. And this is important because ultimately we are asking or we are, it's going to involve some kind of government investment and trade-offs, right? And so there is a need to be, I think, thoughtful about the stakeholders that are engaged in the development of these mechanisms, because that also informs, I think, the quality of the institution or the mechanism that is eventually um, that eventually comes out of it. And then finally, I think when once we think about the governance, once we think about the, the technical operations that are required in terms of risk modeling and stakeholder engagement, is also the financial products and the affordability question, right? Um, these are governments that are severely constrained in terms of financing. Um, many times a Ministry of Finance official will say, I'm not really sure about this insurance when I need to be investing in education, health, et cetera, right? And so there's a case that needs to be made. But beyond the case that needs to be made, there's also a question in terms of how is this actually financed? How do we layer different instruments? How do we understand the costs of these instruments? How, are, how do they reconcile with how the disasters unfold and the longer term financing that is required uh, within these countries? So I think that they offer 
considerable food for thought and I think, um, you know, and could be instructive uh, in the work that's being done by the, um, the, the, the European Investment Bank and others around uh, potential risk pooling uh, mechanisms. But those are just some initial uh, reactions, Christian. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very insightful. Mm -hmm. I have one final question. Um, to Robert and and I think uh, you, Kuse, you you mentioned it already that there are of course also let's say uh, different levels of the government, different players in the government, uh, um, and, and you, I said it's diff different let's say um, uh, uh, um, um, different levels let's say from the municipality to the city to whatever uh, um, uh, um, uh, area you, you would like to go. And Robert, my question is, what is required for an integrated approach to the financial management of disaster risk across all levels of government? And what is currently lacking in, in your experience? Okay, well, thank you for the question. And, and actually, Eko Sure and Olivier have done a great job at articulating the um, perspective on, on disaster risk financing, how, how it should be advanced, especially in, in Africa and the developing country um, perspective. I, I actually want to bring this a, a, a bit back to Europe again, to, to your, your initial report. Um, I mean, actually, just one comment on the question of, of um, cap bonds for European climate risk. I mean, the, the modeling is all there. The modeling is all there and the data is all there, in fact. I mean, it would... It's, it's, you know, it's been possible that there are cap bonds already which cover some climate risks in Europe, including European windstorm and and some flood, I believe. Um, and you know, if, if there were ambitions to to mount a a, a um, cap bond program which actually covered a, a, a number of countries in Europe in the same bond, it would be it would be clearly possible to do that. The 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 models exist. They are. They are fairly mature models. They, 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 they are certainly good enough to support um, cat bonds. So that's just what one, one comment to make. Um, second, I mean, I, I, one, one feature of, I mean, you, you, you've been asking about different levels of government, how they could become involved. Um, I want to give you an example of a um, pot potential way of integrating a cat bond and uh, and an infrastructure bond together. It's, it's, it was a, an idea which was kicked around. I'm not sure if it's quite ever been done. But um, the idea is if you have a community which is subject to flood risk and is already paying flood insurance premiums, so it's, it's at some risk, it's not, not protected, the, uh, there is some form of flood risk transfer, flood insurance already in place. Then it might be worth investing in in building flood defence. That would involve the municipal um, government. It might involve the regional government. But but by building this flood defence, the the money could be raised as a form of of investment bond. And and the the fact that the 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 flood defence uh, has has been built means that the risk is reduced. So everybody needs to pay less. For their flood insurance and before, and you could integrate these two together. You could you could make it such that in the first year the investment goes to build the flood defence, and then you know, over a period of five years, the what was previously being picked up in flood insurance premium actually goes to support the investment required for the flood defence. And after after five years, you've paid off the money raised for the flood defence and. Um, and, and everybody can enjoy reduced risk. So this, this, I mean, this question about how do you make investments which are effective in reducing risk? How do you link those investments to insurance mechanisms? I think is a very fruitful area. I mean, one challenge I mentioned the sort of the ways of really reducing the protection gap ar around insurance mechanisms. I mean, one one feature we need to be a little careful of is that if we if we if we have pure equality in terms of actually how the risk is distributed amongst people whose underlying risk is very different. So if we flat rate it, as in France, for example, then the challenge is where's the incentive for adaptation to to climate change? Because ideally, you want an investment to have an effect on reducing those people whose flood risk is very high and actually 
And in order to do that, there needs to be some differentiation of of the risk cost originally. So sort of, so it, I mean, that's that's a challenge which exists, I think, for 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 all ways of trying to link together an an insurance mechanism as to how how you design it, how you differentiate the risk and and the mechanism around adaptation and around investment from municipal governments, regional governments, national governments on on uh, w which is going to reduce risk for the population as a whole. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Robert. Um, I would like to ask now, uh, Margarita, whether there are any questions also in the chat and also would like to open up the floor if there are people who would like to ask a question here from the audience. Maybe I give first preference to the people here uh, in the room um, and I see somebody raised the hands. Miles, yes. Well, uh, many thanks for your contributions today. Um, lots of you gave positive views on introducing PPPs. Now, the report talks about principles about how to introduce these private-public partnerships. It doesn't go very much into design details. I wonder if you had some views on what the good design details would be for such PPPs. Who would like to take uh, this question? I, mean, I can. I can. Yeah. Start an answer. But, I mean, I mean, yes. I, th I think um, I mean, one key question for design of of um, of some mechanism is is to is this sort of this question about how fair is it around the underlying risk? I mean, for example, supposing you had the ambition to set up a risk pool, a flood risk pool across twelve countries in Europe, then how do you? Uh, how do you balance out the cost to that? I mean, ideally, I, I would say, you know, you've got to evaluate what the flood risk um, exceedance probability curve looks like for each country on its own, and then look to see what happens as you as you pull this risk across multiple countries. There will be events that cause loss in more than one country at the same time. There'll be events that, that cause in loss in single countries. But if you if, you know, in, in order that it's fair, it has to be seen to be fair to work. If one country believes that other countries are are doing very well, you know, at, at, and and it is not doing very well, that that will lead to problems downstream, as they say. And um, yeah, it's, it's, so this, I thought the report actually didn't go into a, a lot of detail about what a fair mechanism would be. I mean, I I would say it involves looking at the risk cost looking at the tail risk, looking at how that is affected by pooling multiple countries and then establishing based on the underlying technicality of the flood risk, it would it would um, determine how, how the costs should be allocated from one country to another. And then I think the, the system itself, you need to revisit this every five years to see if your modeling or your experience or your data is shifting maybe in one country more, you know, People are building houses in in high flood risk areas. We need to we need to check the calculations that were already done. But I mean, I think that if 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 you had that kind of mechanism, it could work um, quite well. Maybe I can add to that. Uh, uh, I I completely agree with the comments uh, made by Robert. I think you know, from my perspective, and it's linked to the question that uh, I think was shared with us earlier, uh, was be clear about the objectives of the PPP. Uh, sometimes we have, you know, these grand ideas, and uh, if you are not clear on what this mechanism is supposed to achieve, uh, it could end up doing a lot of things and nothing at all. Um, the second element, I think, is on the engagement of stakeholders, and I think this con connects with some of the things that Robert had mentioned, which is that we need to engage stakeholders, not only from a government perspective, but also from a public perspective, right, if it is civil society, because that is about building a more comprehensive picture of what that risk and understanding what that risk is at a community government level, but also trust in the mechanism, right? Uh, and that is in turn also linked to the governance element. And the governance is important for transparency and understanding. I think in PPPs, there's also a need to be more thoughtful about aligning incentives between public and private, right? There are things that make PPPs work for public sector and for private sector and certain things don't work, right? Um, and so I think being very clear about what these 
um, or aligning these these um, incentives are upfront is an important part of it. Uh, and I also think uh, fostering long term commitment, uh, addressing the protection gap is not a short term thing either, right? So how do we manage that in changing political context? And that's tied to the governance. Um, and for me, and I'll, I'll, I'll end here, is investment in capacity building. Uh, we, we sometimes, I mean, we, we're technical communities that are engaged in, okay, the risk modeling, maybe on, you know, some of the contingency planning side, uh, but there is a need to really share skills between public and private sector in terms of tools, evolution of tools, so that we can become also a lot more innovative in terms of how we how the PPPs respond uh, to, to what is a very complex um, landscape. If I may, maybe one comment from my side, and again coming more from a developed economy perspective, where the public sector has very, very limited fiscal space. So when you think of PPP, we need to be extremely careful what to recommend, because again, it could all, all, otherwise create some sort of open fiscal exposure. Um, as Ecosy mentioned, it's a means to an end. So I think it has to be very clear what are the priorities of the government. And from a more economic perspective, what are the key market failures you're trying to address? Because if the market was, was to be efficient, you will not, ideally, you will not need some public intervention. And then the public intervention can be many folds. We tend to focus quite a lot on premium subsidies, for example, but there are a lot of market inefficiency that can be addressed in terms of data access, in terms of you know, uh, the basic risk market infrastructure, uh, which could be pretty heavy upfront costs, but then, of course, will not create this kind of, you know, fiscal exposure that the government will have to deal with. But again, from our perspective, this is very much to be very specific on the priorities when we are engaged with governments, uh, and then to clearly identify where the dollar to be provided by the public sector will leverage additional private capital, the dollar provided by the private capital. And it's a, it's sometimes a very difficult equation and very much country specific, even project specific. Okay. Would you want to say something or should we give the floor to... Uh, that we can give it. Yeah, okay. Margarita, do you have any questions from uh, the yeah. audience? Thank you, Christiana. Yes, we have one question from Charles Lowe from Firma. And it's related to what Robert said earlier about the need to increase the take up of private insurance. And he says there may be more options than the two that Robert listed, which were making it mandatory or adding it, for example, to fire coverage for households. So what about, for example, incentives from the public sector? Can also the other panelists think of any other ways? Thank you, Charles. Uh, Devo, uh, I yes. can say something actually yeah. that uh, we had a discussion uh, over the lunch break. Actually, yeah. one yeah. idea that uh, came out uh, was uh, was uh, to um, to actually add it uh, like a mandatory insurance, uh, adding uh, like a tax on uh, the real estate property or something, and then uh, you mm -hmm. could have uh, the tax uh, that uh, force you to insure, and you could have. Uh, then if you insure, you could have some discount or something like that. Yes, Olivier, you also wanted to say something on this? No, again, um, that's a very, very important question indeed. Uh, I, I think from the bank perspective, we're always very careful about tax and mandatory solutions. Yeah. Uh, they tend to be, I mean, difficult to... Uh, to um, uh, uh, one to pass if you pass a law, but also to, uh, to enforce. Uh, if you take the case of the uh, Turkish catastrophe insurance pool, which is well known, uh, uh, it's been running for 20 years with a mandatory law. At the end of the day, the uptake is not as high as it could be. So it does create also some challenges in terms of enforcing those, uh, uh, those mandatory requirements. Uh, you have examples uh, uh, like in France or like in Morocco, where you try to link this kind of mandatory guarantee for catastrophe uh, within a voluntary uh, property insurance products. But of course, it does require that your basic domestic insurance market is well developed. So it, it really depends on the on, on the context. But again, in the current context, imposing taxes or mandatory law is sometimes politically, as you know, very difficult to do, even more so, you know, in, in, in developing economies. Yeah, 